Um, my name is Amanda and I work at the Heinz History Center. I wanna thank you all for joining us this afternoon for uh, a special program that we are doing in honor of Black History Month. Um, I am joined by two of my colleagues who are working behind the scenes. You won't see them probably, um, but they are uh, Laura and Jocelyn and they will be helping to manage the chat and the Q&A uh, as part of this webinar. So um, just so that you are all clear on how this works, uh, we will not be seeing any of you on camera or hearing any of you um, sort of speaking out loud to us. You will be able to talk to us, the, the three of us who are panelists here, using the chat function. Um, so if you want to answer any of the questions we ask or ask questions of your own, you can use the chat. We will also have the Q&A function open so that if you have questions you want to ask about the program as we go through it, you can put them in the Q&A. And um, Laura and Jocelyn will be sort of feeding those questions out to me out loud so that we can talk about them as part of the program. Um, so um, they're gonna put some instructions in the chat as well about how you can access closed captioning. If you want to listen along to the live captions or read along to the live captions as we talk, uh, you will be able to click on the CC button at the bottom of your screen there and pull those up. You can follow the instructions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here in just a second, but uh, one note that I want to make before we get into this, we have offered these programs as um, a sort of special event as part of Black History Month, but these stories that we will be talking about uh, throughout these programs in Black History Month, starting today with the one about the Underground Railroad, are things that we talk about all the time at the History Center. So these are part of some of the regular programs that we offer for schools. We talk about this Black history all year round, not just in February, um, but we're putting a special focus on some of these really important Pittsburgh stories uh, for, for Black History Month this year. So I'm gonna share my screen in just a second here um, and take you through the story of a very important person to how we as historians understand the Underground Railroad here in Western Pennsylvania. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen share set up here so that I can get started there. All right, Laura or Jocelyn, can you just let me know that that's all good? It looked good. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go ahead and get into our program. I put up this map to just get us started because I know that some people who are joining us today might not be from the Pittsburgh area or might not be joining us from Pittsburgh. Um, so I just want to sort of make sure we know where we are located and also where we are located is really important to the story of the Underground Railroad in this area. It's because of where we are that the Underground Railroad comes through uh, Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania. So we're located right here in this sort of uh, southwest corner of Pennsylvania. This border here, the southern border of Pennsylvania, is a line that a lot of people were trying to cross as part of the Underground Railroad so that they could leave these southern states down here, Virginia and Maryland, um, and what is now West Virginia, and come up into states where they could get to freedom, whether that is um, in Pennsylvania or Ohio, or whether they're trying to go all the way up to Canada. Getting up to the shore of Lake Erie made it very easy for, well, easier for people to cross over into Canada and into safety. Um, so where we are located is really, really important. So here we've got the border with Ohio, border with West Virginia, and a little bit of Maryland over here as well. Um, so I've also put up a picture here of, let's see, um, what, what Pittsburgh looks like on a beautiful summer's sunny day with all the beautiful boats in the river. This is not what it looks like if you look outside right now, but it gives us a sense of why our city is important to this story. Because if you notice here, you see these rivers. If you've ever been in downtown Pittsburgh, you know that point there is where the Ohio River is formed. And these rivers that go out into the mountains of Pennsylvania are really important too to the Underground Railroad story here. Because uh, the people who used the Underground Railroad could use the rivers as a quick way to transport people or to move around in this region. So um, it's not only where we are located in terms of the North and the South, but also where we are located in terms of our geography here. Um, lots of forests for people to hide in around uh, Western Pennsylvania, lots of mountains, 
Um, that makes it hard to move around, but the rivers make things a little bit easier for people. Um, there's just a picture of the museum in case you've never been there. Um, I just like to make sure people know that that's where we are normally located uh, when we're working from the museum. That's the Heinz History Center in the Strip District, pretty much in downtown Pittsburgh, right along the Allegheny River. Um, I hope you can come and see our exhibits there soon. Uh, we have a permanent exhibit that's always there that is called From Slavery to Freedom. And a lot of what we will talk about today is uh, from that exhibit and part of that exhibit. So before we get into the story of the Underground Railroad and the story of Charlie Garlick, um, who is our freedom seeker that we'll be talking about, I just want to say a few things about some of the words that we'll be using as we go through the story. Um, so a lot of historians and a lot of museums and a lot of teachers have started to think a little more about the words they use when they talk about slavery and when they talk about people who escape from plantations and maybe use the Underground Railroad. So the first one that we're going to talk about here is this word enslaved person. Uh, so you might hear me say enslaved person or enslaved people, where sometimes people would use the word slave. Now, the reason for that is that if we say enslaved person, it helps us to remember that those people were people, right? They had feelings, they had friends and family, they had lives. Um, they were not, you, it's easy, it's easy to discount a person who, when you're using the word slave in a way that it's harder when you're saying enslaved person, that word helps us to remember that they were people. Um, so I try my best to use the word enslaved person instead of slave. Um, we also use the word freedom seeker. And if you were to come to the museum, you would see this in our From Slavery to Freedom exhibit. Um, where people have sometimes used the word runaway slave or fugitive slave or escaped slave. Um, in our museum, we choose to use the words freedom seeker to describe those people, um, the people who were enslaved and took it upon themselves to leave that situation. And we use freedom seeker because that helps us to remember whenever we talk about them, that at that point when they had left, they were not slaves, they were not enslaved anymore. They had made a very courageous decision to leave that situation and go out into the unknown to seek their freedom. So we always use the word freedom seeker to describe um, those people. Abolitionist is just a word that's there in case people aren't familiar with it. Um, abolitionist is the word for uh, people who work to end slavery. Those can be uh, African-American people who were helping other African-American people through the process of being freedom seekers. Uh, they could be white people who were living in the North or in the South who were against slavery. Really anyone who is doing work to try to end slavery is called an abolitionist because they wanted to abolish slavery. And of course the Underground Railroad. Um, and this is a little bit more important to outline for our younger students usually. Um, sometimes people come to us and their idea of the Underground Railroad is that it was some sort of like train network, almost like a subway kind of thing. Um, and of course, that's not what the Underground Railroad really was. Um, it was more like a secret network of people and hideaway places uh, where they could hide people uh, that these enslaved people, when they became freedom seekers, used to try to get to safety and to freedom. So the Underground Railroad is what we'll mostly be talking about today as we dig into the story of a person who um, who experienced the Underground Railroad and lived to tell us all about what happened to him as part of that. Um, so before I get into it, I can stop now for a second and see if anyone has any um, questions or comments in the chat so far before we get into the history. Anything coming? Oh, well, I have a question. Uh, someone is asking, so not all enslaved people try to escape? That's right. Um, so uh, there's a few reasons for that. First of all, it was very, very risky to try and do that. Um, most people would have tried to leave on their own because they didn't want to risk the safety of lots of people doing it. That meant that if people were leaving on their own, they maybe didn't want to leave their friends and family behind. Um, it's also the case that the further south a person was, the harder it was to actually do this. So 
uh, when we look back at the, the stories that we know of, of people who went through the Underground Railroad situation, they're usually from sort of like Maryland and Virginia and these states that are a little bit closer to the North, not so much from places like Alabama or Georgia or something like that, because those people that were further South would have had a lot more distance to travel and every extra mile that you added to the journey made it that much more risky. Um, so uh, that's right, not everyone was trying to escape and that's not because they didn't want to, that's because the risks were often too great. Someone else asked, could someone be an enslaved person, a freedom seeker and an abolitionist at the same time? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think so it is it is I think entirely possible for a person to have been an enslaved person gone through the underground railroad and become an abolitionist and a person that comes to my mind in that story is Harriet Tubman who went through the whole sort of chain of those uh, definitions there and ended up being a person who was helping lots of people to get to safety as part of the underground railroad. Great question. There's a little bit more, um, there are a number of questions uh, that sort of get at this idea of the language that we're using. Um, and one person says, the word own seems inaccurate. Kidnap might be a more appropriate word. Um, and so, yeah, some of that language that we're using is really hard to find exactly what the right way to describe this is. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very valid point. And a lot of people are thinking you know, this, this language that we're using is kind of adapting more and more quickly as people are, you know, really kind of thinking about how do we, how do we think about this? Um, yeah, absolutely. Very good. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on into the rest of our story here just for the sake of time. But if you all have questions or comments, you can keep feeding those in and I'll keep stopping from time to time so we can address some of them as we talk more. So I've put up this picture here um, that is from 18, or it's showing what the city was like in 1836. So this is, if you see these rivers here, this is the point, this is sort of downtown Pittsburgh today. Uh, in the 1830s, Pittsburgh was a pretty small city. So this was pretty much the city. And the reason that this picture is here is to show that uh, there were a fair number of black people living here in Pittsburgh. Um, a lot earlier than most people would expect. Um, some of those people were, um, were, were quite wealthy here. They were free black people. They had businesses. They had a community of people here who uh, they were building churches and schools for their community. Um, so there was this sort of thriving group of African-American people living here in Pittsburgh um, around the time that the Underground Railroad is happening through here. And you'll notice when we get into the map of Pittsburgh um, that shows where some of those stops on the Underground Railroad were when we get into our story, a lot of them are gonna be in this sort of area down here, um, this sort of lower part of downtown where there were some very wealthy uh, members of the black community here who were, um, who were helping people on the Underground Railroad. So that's just there to give us a sense of what it looked like in terms of uh, if you were coming to Pittsburgh what it would have looked like around you. There were black people here and they were doing pretty well for themselves. That doesn't mean life was, was always perfect for them. Of course, they, they experienced discrimination. Um, they were not treated like the white people in Pittsburgh were treated, but um, there was a thriving community that existed here at that time. These are some of the uh, newspaper ads that some of those uh, black business owners would have put out in the newspapers. So. Uh, we do a lot of searching through historic newspapers to learn about some of these people. Um, so some of them are these sort of names that jump out to us like John Peck. Um, this John Vachon is a person that we will talk about a little bit. He owned a barbershop and some bathhouses here in the city. Um, but this is a good way for us to know a little more about what these businesses were and what sort of audience they were. So a lot of these people own businesses that really served wealthy white people for most of the time that they were open. And then um, if they were working on the Underground Railroad at night, they would kind of shift into helping people in that way. So the person that we're gonna talk most about is this gentleman here, his name is Charles A. Garlick. Now we'll, 
we're going to go through his story uh, and sort of learn about his journey from slavery to freedom. Um, but I want to say a couple of things about him before we get started. He uh, became educated, which is really, really important. He learned to read and write very well. And when he was an old man, he wrote his story. He took the time to write down everything that happened to him as he remembered it from his time uh, going through the Underground Railroad and settling in Ohio, as he ended up doing. Um, that is really, really, really important because so many people had this experience of going through the Underground Railroad, but not very many of them actually wrote down what happened and told sort of people in the future about what that was like for them. So Charlie Garlic is a really, really important source of information for us to know what a person went through on their way through Western Pennsylvania as part of the Underground Railroad. It's also really, really important because a lot of people, when they went through this process of being a freedom seeker, they would change their name. So Charlie Garlic, that's not the name that he was born with. He was given a name when he was enslaved and when he became free, uh, once he made it to safety, he changed his name. Now, if you're a historian going through the historic record and looking for people in census documents and newspapers and things like that, if a person changes their name as an adult and you don't know what they changed it to, it's impossible to learn about them. And so because Charlie Garlic wrote his story, we know what he experienced. And then we can also look up what, where he was living and other details about his life that maybe he didn't include in his book. And so he's a really, really important source for us to understand what was going on in Western Pennsylvania as part of the Underground Railroad. Um, so the book that he wrote was a very long title. Uh, he called his book Life, Including His Escape and Struggle for Liberty of Charles A. Garlick, born a slave in old Virginia, who secured his freedom by running away from his master's farm in 1843. Now, he says old Virginia here. What he means by that is what we would today call West Virginia. So the states once were the same and then West Virginia and Virginia kind of split up. Um, and so when he says old Virginia, he means West Virginia. And we'll see that on the map here in just a second. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show a map of his journey. We're gonna follow that along and um, I'm gonna read out some of his own words that he wrote in his book that tell us about what happened to him and what this experience uh, was like for him. Um, so here is our map. And you remember when we looked at that map before of where we're sort of situated here, Pittsburgh is right here. We've got our border of Pennsylvania, Ohio. This is West Virginia down here in Maryland. And um, so I'm gonna start reading out some of the words that he, he wrote. Uh, we're gonna start with his experience down here in West Virginia. And uh, this is what he says. He says, I, Abel Bogus, now Charles A. Garlic, was born near Shinston, West Virginia in the middle of February, 1827 on the plantation of Richard Bogus. My parents were slave laborers on the farm. He says, I had 11 brothers and sisters. Uh, when he left the old home for the North and that freedom I so often dreamed of. I was 16 years old and it was fully 40 years after I threw off the yoke of bondage and became a free man before I again saw any members of my immediate family, except an older brother, Raleigh, who left the plantation a day or two before I did. Um, so he's kind of setting the scene there um, that he was born on a plantation. He had this family. Um, what ends up happening at the beginning of this story is that um, his whole family sort of tries to escape almost together and they get to a certain point where they're told that there are people coming after them and the, his mother decides to go back to the plantation with some of her children and they basically tell uh, Charlie that he should go ahead and, and keep going and try to gain his freedom. So while he starts out with his family, they end up turning back and he kind of goes on on his own. So he does say there his brother went ahead of him, but they're traveling separately. Um, so he catches up with his brother later on, but he's traveling on his own for most of this journey. Um, so he takes off from down there in West Virginia. Uh, and like I said, you know, these people who were closer to the, the North were more likely to be able to do this. 
and he travels from there into Pennsylvania. His first stop in Pennsylvania is near Uniontown. And so he says here in Uniontown uh, that the Underground Railroad was brought into use wherever possible, and I sometimes used the station to hide from my pursuer. It took one week to reach Uniontown. There I lay hidden in the barn of a friend of my race who provided me with food until three days later when it was safe for me to continue my journey. Um, so it took him a whole week to travel this distance, keeping in mind that he, um, he might not have a great idea of where he's going. If you've ever been in that sort of uh, area between Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Maryland, it's very mountainous. It's not an easy place to, to be traveling through. Um, he's probably traveling overnight. A lot of these freedom seekers would travel overnight so they could hide under the cover of darkness. And he knows that someone is after him. So he's probably very anxious and very nervous uh, and moving quite slowly because he's hiding the whole time. And so when he gets to Uniontown, another black person helps him out, gives him some food and a place to hide. And this is what we mean when we say the Underground Railroad was this sort of loosely organized uh, network. That person got him there and then was probably waiting to figure out where to send him next, like who is available to, to help out in the next place and who can help this person travel safely. Um, so it wasn't something where they went from one stop to the next and it was very set. It was always in, in it was a very fluid situation. So um, he is there in Uniontown getting involved in the Underground Railroad. And of course, from Uniontown, you might be able to guess following those lanterns, his next stop is going to be Pittsburgh. And so this is where it becomes uh, really, really interesting to us as people who study the history of Pittsburgh. So I'm going to put up this map here of downtown Pittsburgh. So again, we have those rivers. We've got the point. This is sort of downtown Pittsburgh today, but again, very small city then. This is pretty much the city uh, at that time. And these stars that are on this map here are all places where we know there was Underground Railroad activity. And there might have been more than that. There were almost certainly more than that. These are the ones that we have hard evidence of, um, of Underground Railroad activity. We can sort of prove it. And so we have the Martin Delaney House here, Monongahela House Hotel, this barbershop, which we're going to talk about a little more. Uh, these are all places where it is African-American people helping on the Underground Railroad. Um, this one up here, Avery College, which is on the north side, um, that was run by Charles Avery, who was a white abolitionist. Um, so lots of different kinds of people were helping out here in the city. But this barbershop, this John Vachon's barbershop, is, is the part that I think gets really interesting with Charlie Garlic's story. So let's see what he has to say about Pittsburgh. He says, I rode rapidly towards Pittsburgh. Um, he's on a horse at this point, which I reached the following night. Vashon kept a station on the Underground Railroad and here I found refuge for three days. He was a gentleman of wealth and hundreds of my race have cause to bless his memory for the help he gave them in their efforts to find freedom. And so this is a really, really important part of the story because so many people may have been helping on the Underground Railroad and we will never know their names. Just like we will never know the names of most of the people who actually experienced the Underground Railroad as a freedom seeker. People weren't writing about this stuff. They weren't really talking much about the specifics, especially while it was happening. Um, so uh, first of all, a lot of these freedom seekers were not able to read and write. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Charlie Garlic's education in a moment, but most people who experienced the Underground Railroad had been living on plantations where they were absolutely not being educated in how to read and write. Uh, so they couldn't really put these names down uh, for us to find them later. They also wouldn't have really wanted to mention these names while it was happening, because what John Vachon was doing by hiding people in his barbershop and helping out on the Underground Railroad was really quite dangerous, very risky. Um, lots of people were trying to catch these enslaved people or these freedom seekers and send them back to plantations. Um, John Vachon could have gotten in trouble with the law for helping people out at certain points. Um, so it's really, really interesting that Charlie Garlic names these people. And I want you to keep in mind that he wrote this book long after the Underground Railroad was over and the Civil War had happened. 
So naming Jean Vachon wouldn't have been putting anyone in danger. Uh, but still, a lot of people who wrote their stories later didn't really name names like uh, Charlie Garlic does in his story. So I've got a picture here of John Vachon um, and some of the ads that we find in the newspaper about his businesses, uh, his fancy hairdressing establishment, um, and the bathhouse that he ran, City Baths, which was sort of like a spa that wealthy people could go to, but then uh, it was also used to um, hide freedom seekers on their way to the north. So if we get back here into Charlie Garlic's story, he isn't going to stay in Pittsburgh. Um, he, in his mind, his goal is to get to Canada. So he is constantly figuring out his next move or people are figuring out the next move for him. So the next thing he does is he carries on in his journey. He spends a little bit of time in Butler County uh, with uh, someone. He stays about a week with someone in Butler County. And then he has to sort of march on to his next place. Uh, and uh, here's what he says about that. After many days of traveling, I arrived in Ohio. I then left my location on foot, reaching Anson Curly Garlic's, Kirby Garlic's home an hour later. After a night there, I planned to continue my journey to Canada, but he asked me to remain with him and go to school. In the South, I had not attended school two days when the master found it out and stopped my efforts to get an education. And so education becomes really, really important to Charlie Garlic. Um, and he, as he says there, someone was starting to teach him when he was living on the plantation and uh, the plantation owner found out and was not having it. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was very coordinated that people living on plantations were not educated. Um, there was this belief that if people learned to read and could understand what was happening, that they would start to uh, try to run away more or even sort of organize and revolt against uh, the plantation owners and all sorts of problems there. So it was it was just not the done thing. Uh, but Charlie Garlic was intelligent. He really wanted to get an education. So uh, Mr. Garlic, whose name is the name that he ended up taking, uh, helps him out with that. And the next little part of his story is really, really important in terms of education. So he's up here in Ashtabula which is this word here, you can see sticking out over the lake. Um, Ashtabula is like a port that goes, uh, the ships go across to Canada from Ashtabula very regularly or along the Great Lake from uh, the Great Lakes from Cleveland to Buffalo. So he was aiming for Ashtabula and stayed there for a while because he thought he could get into Canada from there. But instead of going to Canada, he actually goes to Oberlin, Ohio. And Oberlin is just a little bit off the map that we have here. Um, but he goes to Oberlin so that he can go to Oberlin College, which is still a college today in Ohio. And when Charlie Garlic went there, Oberlin was really known for being one of the first colleges to welcome, to openly welcome Black students to their school. And so uh, when he went there in 1847, he had uh, 50 or 60 other black men attending school with him in a part of the school that they called Liberty Hall. Um, but he was only there for a little bit uh, because he ended up getting sick and having to go back home. Uh, but Oberlin College is a really important part of his story because um, it's a place where a lot of abolitionists were sending their children. So for instance, some of Frederick Douglass's children go to Oberlin. Um, it was a very, very integrated town. So the people who lived there who maybe weren't even with the college were very welcoming to black people in, in the area. Um, and so it was just a really important part of his life story to be able to go to Oberlin and learn alongside all of these people. Uh, but unfortunately he couldn't stay there because he got sick. And so he ended up going back to Ashtabula, uh, where he was living with the Garlic family. But not long after that, Mr. Garlic unfortunately died um, and Charlie had to sort of figure out what to do next. And so once Mr. Garlic had died, the family sold the house and Charlie was just kind of set adrift and he decided to go to Canada. Now this is happening in 1850 and that date is really important to this story because in 1850, as you may know, there was a law passed uh, 
that was called the Fugitive Slave Law. Sometimes today we call it the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And that law changed things a lot for African Americans in all parts of the country. Um, even people who were always free, African Americans who had never been enslaved, were also in danger because of this law. So what this law had said was that it was basically illegal to uh, know that there is a freedom seeker and help a freedom seeker. And if you knew somebody who was helping them and you didn't turn them in to the law, um, then everyone in that whole situation gets in trouble. Um, and so uh, for Black people who were living in America, they were suddenly even more worried than normal that someone was going to capture them and bring them to the South. Because if people brought them to the South, those people would get money. And if people knew about them and didn't say anything, they would get in trouble. And this is a law that people often say is part of the start of how we get to the Civil War, because a lot of people in America, whether they were abolitionists or, or not, didn't want to have that responsibility that the law made them have for maintaining slavery. So any person on the street who knew about a person who was a freedom seeker and didn't turn them in could get in trouble. And that was a huge, huge shift in how people thought about this. It made a lot of African-American people move further north or go into Canada um, so that they could just get away from it. And so Charlie Garlick is one of those people who went to Canada. Um, he was afraid that someone would catch him and turn him into a plantation or his plantation that he came from so they could get their reward money. Um, and then he stayed in Canada for a winter and then decided to come back to the US um, and just sort of try his luck uh, back in the United States. Soon after that, the Civil War started happening and we'll talk more about his story about that in a minute, but this is the house that he came back to. Um, so this is, um, this was in Jefferson, Ohio. So it's near Ashtabula. And there was an abolitionist there uh, named Joshua Giddings who had a law office and Charlie Garlic lived here in this little house. Um, so it used to be, it used to look like this. And then uh, at some point they moved it to a different location so that they could save it. If you were to visit it today, that's what it looks like. But that's the house that Charlie Garlic was living in when he sat down and wrote the story of his life uh, that we've been talking about today. Um, so he made it to freedom. He made it to Ohio. Uh, he was never caught. He never got returned back to the South or anything like that. He had a few close calls. And he was always nervous about that, but, um, but he made it. And we're really, really grateful that we have his story um, to share so we can understand a little more about this. Um, I just wanted to show this very quickly. When we talk about that, that law in 1850 making people leave, this is the population, the black population of Pittsburgh over time. So when we were talking about that, um, that first map that had the different people living in Pittsburgh, the 1830s, it's about there, goes up a little bit to the 1840s. In 1850, there's almost 2,000 African Americans in Pittsburgh, but it drops right down to almost half by 1860. And that's because so many people were just too nervous um, and a lot of people went to Canada or went further north. And so before we get into this last section, I can take a couple questions if there's anything in the chat or the Q&A, um, Jocelyn or Laura. Um, so yes, one person was asking that does a slave become free if their owner passes away? Um, so it depends. That actually, that plays into Charlie Garlic's story actually. So um, Charlie Garlic's, uh, I guess, slaveholder owner um, did die. And in the will, he had tried to free the, the people, the enslaved people that were living there, Charlie and his family. Um, but the will got contested. So basically someone in their family argued with the will and it got overturned. And so there was a point where Charlie might have been freed with his family because their owner died, um, but someone contested the will and kind of changed it. Um, so even when the law was allowing for people to become free after someone had died, sometimes there were other people maybe related to the owner that were trying to fight against that. And um, so that happened quite a lot. Sometimes people were freed as part of the will. If you know the stories of like some of our 
um, our past presidents that were slave owners, they freed a lot of their slaves in their will after they died, but sometimes even that didn't work. Good question. And then there were some questions about the Underground Railroad and how people would identify these stops if they weren't able to read and how was it really set up? And why yeah. is it called that if it's not really a railroad? That's a good question. Um, I think that it's just kind of like a nice way to think about this network of stops. So I think when they call it the Underground Railroad, they're thinking about these, um, these like stations or these places where people are, are getting help. So you might stay for a few days in this one place and that's a stop. Stop makes people think of railroad. That would kind of be my guess. Also railroads were new around the time that this was happening. So I think that's probably where that, um, where that is coming from. But in terms of how they knew where they were going and how they identified stops, there's a lot of stories about things like people hanging lanterns on the front porch or um, you know, leaving these symbols and quilts and things like that. And really as historians, when we look back at it, there isn't a whole lot of evidence that any of that was very widespread. So like one house might have a system that, that they used to signify to other people that they could hide someone today or that they couldn't or, or whatever, but there wasn't really anything coordinated over the whole system at all. And so that means people like Charlie Garlic are just having to rely on someone telling them where to go next or getting them set up with the next person. There's really no way to know where they were going. So was Pittsburgh more accepting towards freedom seekers and why was that? There, so there are a lot of stories where Pittsburgh was a lot more accepting of freedom seekers. Um, there were also people living in particularly around the outskirts of Pittsburgh who had been slaveholders themselves. So it's complicated to say whether um, Pittsburgh was all over very friendly to abolitionists or to freedom seekers. Um, definitely in that sort of like golden triangle area, the point in the sort of downtown area, um, there were there are stories that you can look up in the newspapers of the time where um, someone might be staying somewhere like the Monongahela House Hotel. They've traveled into town with enslaved people that they own that are traveling with them to help them out or whatever. Um, and the people who work at the hotel kind of steal away those enslaved people and get them to freedom. And then people from that plantation come to Pittsburgh trying to look for them and they get sort of fought off by Pittsburghers saying, you're not gonna come here and do that. Um, so Pittsburgh kind of becomes known as a place that you wouldn't wanna bring enslaved people because they're probably gonna find their way off to somewhere else. That's not to say that everyone in the area was friendly to it, but uh, we do have like a tradition of abolitionist uh, activity around here. I'll leave you with one last question. And they were saying, were students at the school racist towards black students? I think we're talking about both Oberlin and the school in Ashtabula. So I don't know much about the school that he went to in Ashtabula at all. Uh, what I do know about that area of Ohio, though, is that they were very friendly to freedom seekers. A lot of abolitionists lived up there and were helping, were actively helping uh, people get to freedom. Ashtabula, especially, there's a whole museum about um, the Underground Railroad there that's really interesting. Um, and Oberlin, it's hard to say if there was any racism that people faced. It has a, a, a reputation for having been uh, very, very welcoming and very, very open. Um, and that would be my answer that they were, you know, they, Oberlin College was only open for one year as a whites only school. The very second year they were open, they started openly accepting black students. Um, and that says to me that it's, it was sort of built in from the start for them. So good question. I'm going to hop in here. I know we're looking at time. We are. Um, <laughs> there is a question. There's been a couple questions about terminology. Um, one question specifically, why do we use the term freedom seeker instead of freedmen, uh, the term of, that former enslaved people use to describe themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. And so I know that freedmen gets used a lot um, uh, like there was the Freedmen's Bureau after the Civil War and things like that. And, and you're right, I think people like um, uh, Frederick Douglass would have called themselves a freeman. Um, freedom seeker is something that I know our curator settled on as the word that he uh, wanted to use in the From Slavery to Freedom exhibit. I know the National Park Service also uses that word in their 
um, uh, like at the Frederick Douglass House and all of the sort of museums that they run that connect to this story. And for me, the thing is this, um, this seeking, this freedom seeking, because that tells us that they, they had to make that hard choice to go out and do this. And it kind of reminds me that they sacrificed a lot to do that. It wasn't an easy decision. Um, and it was something that they had to take on themselves to decide to do to seek their freedom. Where Friedman is maybe something that people are called once it's happened, if that makes sense. Great. I, hope that kind of answers that. I think that helps us a bit. Um, the, there are two other questions. The one is how old was he when uh, Charlie Garlic when he wrote his book? Um, I don't know exactly how old he was. I know that he was old, like he was an older man. It was, I think, uh, the early 1900s. Um, and he died in 1912. So um, I would say he was probably in his 60s or 70s. Um, Great. And then the last, um, there are two questions that are sort of about rights um, of uh, African Americans. Um, if one question is, were free Black people citizens once they were free? And the second was, were African American people able to marry white people at that point in time? So the citizenship question is really complicated. Um, and that might actually be too complicated to answer in the time that I have left here. Um, so at least in Pennsylvania, if you think about citizenship, there was a point up until I think it's 1838, where black people living in Pennsylvania, if they were free and they owned land and they paid taxes, uh, they could vote in the 1830s, up until the 1830s. And then Pennsylvania passed a law that took that away from them. And that's something that people talk a lot about. What does it mean to be a citizen? Um, you know, how do we show citizenship and, and, and perform citizenship and voting is a huge one. So it depends on when you're talking about and where. Um, and I forgot the other part of the question. <laughs> Can you remind me, Laura? <laughs> I muted myself. Um, uh, could African Americans marry white citizens? Yes. Um, so there are some of the um, some of those um, uh, the black uh, business people that I mentioned in the start. There, some of them did end up marrying into white families, or white families sort of married into them. Um, so it did happen. Um, I don't know, like overall, everywhere how how common that was, and certainly in the South, that would not have really happened. Um, but uh, it, it did happen sometimes up here. Again, that kind of gets, um, in some places that becomes illegal at a certain, it wasn't always illegal and then it becomes illegal. Um, good questions. I'm gonna have to move on to this next little part though. Um, and we can see if we've got a second at the end. I just wanna show some of these other uh, ways that we know about Charlie Garlic. So obviously we have his book, we have his words, but we're historians, we like to do research, we like to dig through the documents and see what we can see. Uh, and so I'm gonna skip through this slide just so I can show you what we're actually looking at here. Um, we have uh, gone back into the historic record to find some of these things that help us to know about Charlie Garlick's life. So for instance, this is the 1830 census, uh, which is uh, the census, as you probably know, is where we count everybody who lives in the country every 10 years. And so in 1830, we can see here, if you remember this name, Richard Bogus, that's the name that Charlie gave as the person who owned the plantation that he was enslaved on. And um, Charlie's name when he lived on this plantation was Abel Bogus. And this count here is showing um, slaves. These are the enslaved people uh, that lived there uh, and, and the free white people and then free colored people. And so we have Richard Bogus here. We can see he has one, four, seven, eight enslaved people living with him uh, on his property. And that's in 1830. So Charlie will be one of those people in that, um, in that count with the rest of his family. And then when I said it was really important that Charlie Garlic wrote that story so we know his name, that's because it means we can then take that on and trace his story going forward. For people who change their names, but we don't know what their original name was, it's just really hard to connect those dots. 
And so because we have that name, Charles Garlick, we can look him up. And so we looked him up in the census in 1850. This shows him living in Ashtabula. So that's that place up by Lake Erie in Ohio. He's 25 years old. He's a black male. He's working as a laborer and he's from Virginia, um, which we now know he's actually from West Virginia. Uh, but something I think is really interesting about this. So the census kind of writes people down in order of where they live. So the people who are either side of him on this list will be either people who lived in the same house or they were neighbors of his. And if we look at this here, you see where I just drew this box around these other two uh, people here. Um, this person here, Alan Saunders, is a 33-year-old black male laborer from Tennessee. And this person, George Garlick, is 22 years old, black male laborer from Virginia as well. And so if you were to look at this whole page, almost everyone on this page is a white person, except these three men living together as laborers, and they all came from states in the South. And so that says to me that Charlie Garlick must have, at least for a little while, had a little community of other freedom seekers living with him in Ashtabula where he was. Um, so those are the kind of things that he might not have said that in his story, but we can kind of dig a little deeper and learn that. Uh, we can also learn here that he, um, during the Civil War, he joined the U.S. Colored Troops. So you can see this USCT up here. That was the part of the U.S. military where Black men were allowed to sign up for the Northern Army and fight uh, on the side of the North. So Charlie Garlick joined up. Uh, fought in the U.S. Colored Troops. It mentions down here that he fought in Memphis, Tennessee uh, on behalf of the Northern Army. Um, and so that's another thing that doesn't appear in his story, but we can dig a little deeper and learn these other things about him. It also gives us a little description of him. So he's 40 years old. He's about five foot six. Um, he's got a black complexion and black eyes and black hair. Um, so it kind of describes a little bit about what he looked like that we maybe wouldn't get from the pictures. And we can also look up this here. Um, you can see uh, this is just a sort of city directory record. Um, it lists uh, his death on May 5th of 1912. Um, if you need something to kind of connect 1912 to, if you've ever learned about the Titanic sinking, and it was that same year, um, which normally helps people put it in like a timeline, um, which is interesting for me to think about the Underground Railroad kind of leading into uh, the Civil War leading into that time period, but he lived a nice long life in Ohio. Uh, lots of people in Ohio took good care of him. If you want to look up his obituary from when he passed away, um, people had some really nice things to say about him um, in that. So um, that gives us sort of the story of Charlie Garlick and how he's important to our area and uh, how we can learn more about the Underground Railroad through him. I'm aware that I've gone over on the time a little bit. I'm going to stop my screen share here. Um, were there any last things that we should cover in terms of questions, uh, Laura or Jocelyn? Um, so there is one question about the book and someone mm -hmm. would like to actually read the book. Yes. Um, so I can, you know what, I'm actually going to drop the link to the book in the, um, in the chat here because it's on a university website. And I just want to make sure that I, it's harder to describe than it is to just link to. Um, give me a second here. There we go. And while you're doing that, can you explain why some of the names on that census didn't have a race listed next to it? Those would have all, so basically, especially up in somewhere like Astrobula, where it's a lot of white people, they were just saving time by not writing W's for all the white people. So basically, if it's an empty box, you can assume that they were white people and they didn't have to make a mark to say otherwise. Okay, um, I also just want to say too that um, part of us doing these programs, we also have some Kahoot quizzes that we have put out uh, that go with them. Uh, so students, you can see what you've learned, uh, how much information you've picked up. Um, Jocelyn or Laura are going to drop the information for those Kahoots in the chat. Uh, we're sort of running it as like a challenge or a sort of contest. 
Um, so uh, it is a Kahoot that's on our account. You'll be able to take it. We'll send out an email once all of them close to teachers to let people know how it went uh, and who did well on the Kahoot quizzes. They're open until March 1st. So it's for the whole month of February. Um, so they're gonna drop the links in there. Um, students, if you take those Kahoot quizzes, please make sure that you name yourself as your name and then an abbreviation for your school. Um, teachers, you may wanna give them whatever abbreviation you want people to use for that. It's just so that we'll be able to tell on our end what school the students went to if they're filling out those Kahoot quizzes. Um, so we should have those, yep, those links, uh, that link just went into the chat there. You'll also, teachers, you will get that by email. I'm gonna send an email around shortly here with the recording of this presentation, um, a survey to ask you how it went, um, the Kahoot link, and a couple other things as well. So uh, anything we should cover before we finish here? Okay. No. All right. We are going to go ahead and let you all go. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you um, enjoyed learning a little more about our, our region's uh, proud abolitionist history and our story of the Underground Railroad here. Um, we hope you can all join us someday at the museum uh, to see the From Slavery to Freedom exhibit sometime. And uh, thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of your day.